Captain America throws his mighty shield. All those who chose to oppose his shield must yield. If he's led to a fight and a duel is due, then the red and the white and the blue will come through when Captain America throws his mighty shield. The year is 1978, and the Sentai franchise is now a faint memory. A small experiment in the ever growing list of projects created by Shotaro Ishinomori, who had already moved on to other projects and left Sentai behind. It seemed that Sentai would eventually be forgotten and consigned to an interesting tidbit in the long and storied history of Japanese media, until it got some help from an unexpected benefactor. Around this time, Toei signed a three-year licensing deal with Marvel in which the two companies were allowed to use each other's properties however they wanted. The American comic book industry was in the midst of the Bronze Age of comic books, an era of comics focused on more mature storylines dealing with serious storytelling. During this shift in comic book storytelling dynamics, Marvel was working on branching out, and part of that involved expansion into overseas markets. People often compare and argue about Western entertainment versus Eastern entertainment, but the two are actually far more intertwined and related than they realize. As a part of this deal, Marvel utilized the designs of Toei's Com Battler V and Danguard Ace in their comic adaptation of Shogun Warriors, and Toei started airing a Japanese version of Spider Man. Yeah, everyone knows Spider Man. A nerdy kid who got bitten by a scientifically altered spider and gained spider-related powers, swinging around New York to stop crime? Well, this show was nothing like that. This Spider-Man was a motorcycle racer named Takuya Yamashiro, who gains superpowers when he gets injected with the blood of an alien from Planet Spider, giving him spider powers and access to the Spider-Man suit, and a giant warship called the Marveler, which can transform into a giant robot named Leopardon. It was popular enough to consider being turned into a franchise, but because of the three-year limitation to the original licensing deal, coupled with the licensing fees Toei had to pay Marvel for utilizing their characters, meant that Toei opted not to continue creating more Spider-Man shows. In fact, licensing issues have plagued this particular series for years afterwards, making merchandising and home media collections of the series somewhat of a challenge for Toei to distribute. But Toei had another problem. They still had a licensing deal with Marvel for which they wanted to utilize to its fullest extent, but didn't want it to cause problems when the contract was up. They also wanted to use Marvel's character, Captain America, for a new tokusatsu series. It would be called Captain Japan and would feature the titular character teaming up with other similar heroes from other countries to fight evil. However, even this had the danger of running afoul of licensing issues after the initial broadcast. Fortunately for Toei, there was a franchise that was completely dormant that would let them create an IP that was wholly owned by them, while using Marvel characters as an inspiration for the newly minted series. Marvel would still be named as a co-producer. However, because the characters were technically all original, Toei could still retain control of the license even after the end of their three-year licensing deal with Marvel. The franchise was, of course, Sentai. Instead of having a single hero that teamed up sporadically with other heroes from overseas, why not have a team of superheroes from different cultural backgrounds? Sentai was primed for a comeback. But this wouldn't be the Sentai of years past. It would be Super Sentai, a brand new Sentai series with a brand new cast of characters, and a fresh start for the franchise as a whole. And thus, Battle Fever J was born. Even though it's commonly viewed as the third entry in the franchise, Battle Fever J was officially the first entry in the Super Sentai series up until 1995, 
when Toei decided to fold Go Ranger and Jaka into the series continuity. As a result, it occupies an awkward, albeit interesting, space in Super Sentai history. It introduced some major elements that eventually became staples in the Super Sentai franchise, but it also featured some oddities that make it stand out as a product of its time. First of all is its name. Much like Jekka before it, Battle Fever J features a naming scheme for its team that is radically different from its successors, without including the term Sentai in the title. Weirder still is the name itself. Battle Fever J? Was this a team of berserkers or something? In truth, the creators wanted to tap into the zeitgeist of the pop culture at the time. And what was the biggest pop culture phenomenon of the late 70s? Disco! Yes, the title is a reference to Disco Fever, Boogie Fever, Saturday Night Fever, and any other fever that was associated with dancing. Which is why the team dances whenever they jump into battle. Thus, Battle Fever J. Coincidentally, Disco died out not too long after this season aired. The biggest element that Battle Fever J receives criticism for are the costumes. To be fair, most of the team's costumes are just fine. The color schemes are varied, each team member has a costume unique to him or her that also ties into a unified design, and aside from the odd goggle-styled visors that never show up again in future seasons, the helmets are pretty well designed too. This season started the design trend of sculpting lips directly onto the helmets, although they went the extra step and added noses too, with mixed results. However, one element was enough to ruin the synergy of the entire design aesthetic of the season. They put a wig on Miss America's helmet. On one hand, the direction they went for for their design philosophy for Battle Fever J made it difficult to design a helmet that would look feminine without including hair. On the other hand, just look at it! It fell so far into the uncanny valley, I didn't even hear it hit the bottom. It looks like it fell off the top of the ugly tree and hit every branch on the way down. This is one of the worst designed tokusatsu helmets I've ever seen in my life, and it all goes back to that stupid blonde wig. Sentai has never had a wig helmet again after this, for good reason. Meanwhile, this season also introduced giant mecha fights into the franchise, and on that front, the Battle Fever Robo is really well designed, with a samurai motif and a large arsenal of weapons. Ultraman growing 50 stories tall to fight a giant monster is cool, but nothing can beat piloting a giant robot to slice monsters in half with an enormous katana. It doesn't hurt that the ship that the robot was stored in, the Battle Shark, also looked badass. It also started the combinable weapon trend in Sentai. Each team member has his or her own unique weapon, and they could combine their weapons into the Penta Force to defeat their enemies. Many of the staple elements from modern Super Sentai seasons can be traced back to Battle Fever J. The season starts with a terrorist cult by the name of Egos terrorizing the world. They conscript people into their ranks by promising them material success and wealth, and fulfill these promises by means of cursing, killing, or otherwise getting rid of people in their way. Egos is led by its namesake, Satan Egos, who is basically just dime store Black Cross Fuhrer. His two commanders, Hedda and Salome, are the ones who oversee day-to-day -day operations of the cult. Satan Egos also creates monsters from various materials such as animals or even humans in order to act as field leaders for his schemes. The general of the Ministry of Defense, Tetsuzan Kurama, decides to create a counter-terrorism unit to fight Egos. This unit is named Battle Fever. Toei wasn't going to make the same missteps they had made when they created Jaka. So they went for a more basic and child-friendly approach with Battle Fever J. The opening has a chorus that's sung by children. Kids routinely show up to interact with the team. There's a cute little animal mascot in the form of Kyutaro. And many of the episodes involving kids revolve around morals admonishing specific vices like laziness or envy. As such, much of the first half of Battle Fever J is episodic content that can be boiled down to something like Ego's promises to make kids smart, but it is actually replacing those kids with super intelligent robots to make their parents happy. Battle Fever comes in and saves the day. As the commander of Battle Fever, Tetsuzan is the consequent Japanese father figure. He's traditional, stern, and strict, and he's also the brains and discipline behind the team. However, just because he generally doesn't participate in fieldwork doesn't mean he can't hold his own in a fight. 
Battle Fever is comprised of five international agents, who each bring something different to the team due to their unique skills and abilities. I say international, but all it really means is that the group is composed entirely of Japanese agents that receive training in various different countries. Masao Den is Battle Japan, a practitioner of Japanese martial arts and ninjutsu. Much like the Red Rangers before him, Masao doesn't really stand out among the group other than being the leader, as he's the typical Japanese everyman. Traditional, stoic, and hardworking. That said, he does make a good lead character, and the episodes that focus on him are some of the more interesting ones in the season, because they often involve him engaging in subterfuge and espionage against Egos. Kensaku Shiraishi hails from Central Asia and becomes Battle Cossack. Kensaku lived in Central Asia until both his parents died, and eventually the priest running the orphanage he was at died while protecting him. Shortly afterwards, he was found and adopted by General Tetsuzan, and he eventually joined the Department of Defense. In one of his focus episodes, his mentor is gunned down in front of his daughter Mayumi, and Kensaku suffers a crisis of conscience when she accuses him of being no different than the men that killed her father. He tries to cheer Mayumi up by taking her out while leaving his battle suit behind, but they are attacked and Kensaku is violently gunned down while trying to protect her. Jin Makoto, Kensaku's friend and rival in the Department of Defense, takes up the mantle of Battle Cossack for the rest of the season. Jin lost a brother to Egos years prior, so he has a more personal stake in the fight. And while Kensaku is more of a team player, Jin is more of a loner. Kyosuke Shida is a fencing champion from France, and appropriately becomes Battle France. However, he's also foppish and lazy, and he would rather lounge around flirting with women than actually do work. He still has his serious moments, but most of the time he forms a comedy duo with Shiro Akebono, who worked in Africa to preserve wildlife, and thus became Battle Kenya. He can speak to animals, has excellent tracking abilities, and has the best survival skills in the team. Finally, we have Diane Martin, an FBI agent that joins the team as Miss America after her father is killed by Egos. All I have to say about Diane is that she is a massive step down from previous female Sentai characters. In Go Ranger, we had Peggy, who was a brilliant explosives expert. And in Jacka, we had Karen, who was an intelligent and competent police detective. But there is no way in hell I would buy that Diane is an FBI agent. She's more of a stereotype of the Japanese impression of American women, obsessed with shopping and fashion. She's even more foppish than Kyosuke, and in fact they are often seen shopping and relaxing together. Actually, she never really does anything noteworthy the entire time she's part of the team. In one episode, the team has to investigate an all-girl college dormitory due to rumors of a ghost, and they concoct various schemes to infiltrate the dorm. Believe me, I know how it sounds, but it's all on the up and up. For the most part. Anyway, it never occurs to them to just send in Diane. Where is she while all this is happening? No one knows! To be fair, this is partly because the actress for the character, who is also named Diane Martin, did not speak fluent Japanese. If you watch the scenes she participates in and listen closely, you'll notice that her lip movements and what she's saying don't exactly sync. You might also notice that her voice is oddly familiar. That's because they had to have Lisa Komaki, the actress for Peggy Matsuyama from Go Ranger, dub over all her lines. This begs the question of why she was cast in the first place. I suppose we'll never know. Maybe because of a combination of all these factors, Diane gets replaced mid-season by Maria Nagisa. Maria is a Japanese woman who was sent to America to train with the FBI, and she guards Diane's sister Catherine when she comes to Japan to visit. Of course, Egos gets their hands on Catherine and are able to determine that Diane is Miss America and are successfully able to lure her out using Catherine as bait. Diane becomes injured because of this and is unable to continue being Miss America, and Maria joins the team as her replacement. As far as characters go, Maria is far more preferable to Diane. While Diane was a lazy, superficial, and flaky woman whom nobody would ever believe was an FBI agent, Maria is competent, smart, and is driven by a childhood trauma where she was too afraid to help a boy who drowned. Once the show had established itself, the story got better as the writers became more comfortable with changing up the status quo. Aside from the aforementioned episodes where team members were replaced, 
There were also episodes that raised the stakes. The first half of the season has Battle Fever hiding their identities as they fought Egos. But eventually their identities are exposed, and as a result Egos' attacks on them become more focused on their personal or family lives. Eventually, Hedda targets and kills General Tetsuzan's mentors, and kidnaps one of his operatives along with her little brother, and challenges him to a duel. In what is possibly the best fight scene of the season, Hedda underhandedly blinds Tetsuzan and it looks like he's about to win, but Tetsuzan ends up going all Zatoichi on Hedda and his pupils and comes out victorious. Eventually, Satan Egos decides he's had enough and tries to blow up the Battle Fever headquarters and revives Hedda as a monster to do it. When that fails, he tries to lure Battle Fever into his headquarters and turn them into monsters subservient to him. When that fails, he just drops all pretense and bursts from his headquarters, killing what's left of his followers, and tries to destroy the world. After a particularly anticlimactic battle, Battle Fever kills him with the Battle Fever Robo, and apparently Satan Egos is a load-bearing boss monster because after he dies, everything that was being powered by him just collapses or explodes. With the threat gone, the heroes ride off into the sunset. All in all, Battle Fever J is a pretty average season. It starts off slow, but it does have some interesting episodes that make it a worthwhile watch, even if some of the episodes have absolutely nonsensical plots. It's certainly not the worst season, but it's nowhere near the best either. That said, Battle Fever J's influence in Super Sentai can be felt to this day, and it did quite well in both ratings and toy sales, enough to warrant a new season being greenlit for production. Next episode, we'll take a look at Battle Fever J's successor, Denshi Sentai Denjiman. If you like what I'm doing with my channel, please hit that like button. If you're new here, please hit that subscribe button. The Super Sentai Overview is a production by the fans for the fans. And of course, we appreciate the support of any and all of our viewers. Please look forward to the content I'll be putting on this channel in the future. And I'll see you next time. Abayo!